Our next graph topic is going to be uh, shortest path algorithms. And shortest path algorithms come in a variety of forms. So when we say shortest path, we need to actually uh, distinguish a little bit what type of problem that we're dealing with. So one type of shortest path problem is a single source. And this is where you have a graph and there is some node that you that's your starting node, and you're going to follow the graph and hopefully make your way to either some particular goal, or maybe you want to find the shortest path to every possible node other than the, the, the single source that's there at the beginning. Uh, the other option is in all pairs. And in all pairs, you don't have a single source. You instead want to know every node and what the shortest path is between any particular pair of nodes. And so it should be kind of obvious that for all pairs, this is going to generally be n squared uh, pieces of information that you want. For single source, this is going to be order n, in particular n minus one uh, values that you need to know. So you do have to distinguish, do you want a single source or do you want all pairs? And there's different algorithms that are better or worse for each one. Now you can pretty easily see it is possible to, uh, to generate all pairs by just running single source from each node. However, that's not going to be optimal. Uh, that, will, that will take longer because the algorithm, this is, not, this is not the order of the algorithm, this is the size of the output that you get. Okay, so besides single source and all pairs, another thing that you need to know is, uh, is it a weighted or is it unweighted? And we mentioned before that if you have an unweighted graph, this is when you can use your breadth first search. So if you ever have an unweighted graph where there's no edge weights, you can use breadth first search and, and deal with it that way and that will give you the shortest path. The next thing that you need to determine is can edges have a negative weight? Okay, so this means that we've got a graph and it might be that some of the edges in there, maybe this has weight two and this has weight negative one. So you could actually potentially have edges that have a negative weight. And that changes which types of algorithms you want to use or exactly how you would use the algorithm. And there's a slight variation on this question, in particular, the question of can you have a negative weight cycle. In other words, is there some cycle that you can have where if I go around the cycle in order, the overall weight in the cycle is going to be negative. So if you look at this, if I add up all the edges on that cycle, it's a weight of negative one. And you can see that if you have a negative weight cycle, uh, then Basically, it's impossible to have a real shortest path between any of the points that could go through that cycle because you could just go around that cycle as many times you want as you want and just keep getting more and more and more and more negative. And so there's not really any definition of a shortest path. You could, you could get it arbitrarily short as long as you would pass through any one of these nodes along a path from one node to another. Um, so... It, there are times when you can have a negative weight edge, a single negative weight edge, but you don't have a negative weight cycle. So uh, you, might have, you might have a situation where you're guaranteed that you can't have a negative weight cycle, even if some of the edges might be negative along the way. And in those cases, there's other algorithms that you can use. So all of these are the questions that you need to answer when you deal with shortest path. Um, the the again, the single source shortest path on an unweighted graph, that's just our standard BFS that we've seen before. So I'm going to go through and talk about some of the different algorithms that we can use for each one of these. And I will start out with one of the most famous algorithms. It's one that you should remember. It is a single source shortest path on a weighted graph. And this is the well-known Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so Dijkstra's algorithm is, it's one of the, those that you learn 
uh, very early on. Uh, the idea here is that you are going to keep a priority queue. of the nearest node not yet visited. So we're going to keep a priority queue saying which node of, of the ones that we haven't yet visited, which one is nearest to us. And we're always going to pull off the next nearest and then we're going to process it. And then for the node we are processing, we will do something called relax the edges. So the term, the term that's used is, uh, is to relax the edges. And what that means is if I have a node and I've got some node at a distance like five and I've got an, an edge here that's three and I've got some node on the other end of the edge and let's say that we already found something that said it was distance 10 there. Well, by relaxing this edge, by saying I'm gonna relax this edge, that means that I can go from five, I can follow that edge and I can get to this node in a distance eight. Okay, so relaxing the edge means I'm gonna follow the edge and if it's possible, I will replace the old distance with the new shorter distance to the node on the other side. And if you imagine keeping this priority queue, and this is basically implemented as a heap, if you imagine keeping that heap, this is going to be a decrease key operation. So when you learned heaps originally, you should have learned about the decrease key uh, operation. Uh, it's something that potentially moves something up in the heap so that it gets a, a higher priority. So this is a min heap. Um, I, should, I should have mentioned that it's a min heap. And that will uh, move things higher in the priority list. Now, I want to take just a second. Um, well, OK, before I, before I go on, and let's just finish how this works. When you do this, you just keep pulling off the next node and relaxing the edges. And eventually you either reach your, I'll say goal, or once you've processed all the vertices, you're, you're done. So you stop when the queue is empty, or if you reach the goal, or when you reach the goal. So if your goal, if you were trying to just reach to a particular node, as soon as you reach that in Dijkstra's algorithm, you're done. Uh, as soon as you pull that one off of the queue, uh, if you actually want the single source and you want the shortest distance to every other node, then you need to go until the priority queue is empty. Now, I wanna mention one thing about actually implementing this, especially if you do this in C++. The, so C++, if you remember, has a priority queue function, um, but it's always a max heap. Uh, so you need to either change the comparator, you need to change the comparison function that's being used so that instead it's a min heap, uh, or another hack that you can use is just negate everything when you put it in and then, you know, unnegate it, negate it again when you pull it back out. Uh, so that, that will make it a min heap instead. But there's a problem with the standard C++ implementation, and that is this decrease key does not exist. So even though C++ is using a heap, it does not implement the decrease key operation on that heap. And so the priority queue, if you use the standard C++ STL priority queue, you cannot just use Dijkstra's algorithm the way that you normally do. And so the way that you would implement this uh, in C++ with, and maybe this will change someday, maybe they'll actually add the decrease key uh, in there. But if you're doing this with the STL, um, instead of decreasing the key, decrease, sorry, instead of using decrease key, uh, you enter node into the priority queue. second time. OK, 
Okay. Um, so if you if you're ever going to decrease the key, you just put it in the priority queue a second time. And so that means that you might have a node, like in this example up here, let's call this node here B. Okay, we might have B in the priority queue two times. We might have B in the priority queue with eight. That's the most recent one that we put in. Or we and we have B in there with ten. That's the that's the old value that we had before. So if we if we have the priority queue, uh, we're once we finally pull out B and work on it, then anytime we pull out B later on, we want to first check and say, have we already handled this? And if you've already handled it, then just ignore it. Okay, so let's let's run through a quick example of this just so you can see what this looks like. Um, I'll I'll draw a graph here, and we will we'll, uh, look and see what this might look like uh, if we run Dijkstra's algorithm on it. So let's see. I'll make a few nodes here. Maybe I don't know seven nodes. Um, and maybe this is going to be my start. This is going to be my, my source up here. And I'll make edges coming out of it, going to some of these others. So I've got three and five and four, two. Mm. We need a way to get down there. Okay, so there's a graph with uh, various edge weights. And let's say, just, just to make, make our lives interesting, let's say that that's the goal. Okay, so the way that this will work is we will start off, we'll start off with the source, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to label these with letters just so that I can refer to them more easily. A, B, C, D, E, F and conveniently the goal is G. Okay, so I'm wanting to get from A to G. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say as I'm going to keep track of of all of the different nodes, and this will be in a prior. This will actually be in a heap or a priority queue, uh, but I might not. I'm I'm not going to actually try to draw the heap structure here. So I'm just going to list all of the nodes: A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I'm going to list the distance that each one is currently away from the source. So A at the very beginning is very close by and everything else is infinitely far away. In other words, we don't know of any route that's there. So each turn, I'm going to pull off the lowest value thing that's here that I haven't processed yet. And I'm going to then relax all of the edges that come out of it. So I will first pull off A. So A has a distance of zero, that should be obvious, it's the source. Um, and I'm, I'm going to relax all of the edges for it. And so when I do that, I get that D is a distance four away, so this is a distance zero, and E is a distance five away, and B is a distance three away. So now to update the priority queue, B was a uh, distance three, and D was four, and E was five. Okay, so now I pull the next thing out of the priority queue, um, the next smallest thing. So the smallest one now is B. This is the one that is three. So I will pull B out and I say B is a distance three away. Okay, so now I will relax the edges coming out of B. So the edges coming out of B, I see there's this one going down to E. And so notice that B is a distance three and this edge coming out of B is distance five. I'll do this in green just so you can see it. Okay, that edge is going to be a is going to have weight one and it goes to E, which so far had the lowest possible value of five. Well, now I have a new shortest route. I can get to B in three and then one more would get me to E in five, so uh, in four. So instead of five, we're going to have a distance four for E, okay? And likewise, over here, we relax this edge. Now C, instead of being infinity far away, is going to be a distance of nine away. 
All right, so the next thing we can do is we can pull off the next smallest thing that we see in the priority queue. We've actually got a tie here. And remember, if we wanted to use the C++ priority queue, we would actually have E entered into the list two times. We'd have it in there as both five and as four, okay? Um, but I look at the next smallest thing, I see this one D is a distance four away. So I will say that D is four away and I will go ahead and process it, and I'll relax all of the edges coming out of it. So the first thing I wanna do is I look at this edge, which is a distance two away, four plus two is six, and E, sorry, I didn't, I didn't update this, E is already, we know a route that gets there at four, so going four plus two, this does not reduce it, so we don't do anything with that. After we relax it, that doesn't do anything for us. When we take this edge, we now can get to F in a distance of seven. So F is going to have the distance seven for us. Okay, we've processed D. We will now pull the next smallest one. That is this E that is four away. So E we can mark as four away. And we will process the edges coming out of E. So the edges coming out of E, well, we have this one over here going to C. So four plus three, we can get to C and seven. And sure enough, that's going to be a little bit faster. So I'll, I'll mark this one in red. Um, so we get a distance seven away for C. And again, we might have actually stored up in our priority queue uh, in C++, we might have both nine and seven put into the priority queue with C. Uh, because we don't have the de decrease key, we can't just decrease the key from nine to seven, we have to just enter a new one in as seven. Um, we also have this route down here from E, um, which is four plus six, so that means that we can get to G in a distance of 10. Since it used to be infinity, I'll just go ahead and update it to 10. All right, so the next thing we would do is pull off the next smallest one. Now notice if we, if we had to, that could have been a five for E, but we would have said, oh, we've already processed E. We're going to ignore that along the way. So the next smallest thing that we see, it looks like is C at a distance of seven. So when I process C, now if I look at the edges coming out of it, there's only one. So seven plus two says that I can get to uh, G, and, and I'm, hang on, I'm going to write all of these in there. So C is at a distance of seven, G is at a distance of 10, F is at a distance of seven, which was actually, I'd written it in green, so I'll do that. Um, so the next thing that we pull off is, uh, is uh, C at a distance of seven. When we relax the edge, we now have a way to get down to G. Uh, instead of 10, we can get there in a distance of uh, nine, seven plus two. So G instead of 10 becomes nine. Okay, um, next we pull off F. Um, so we process F. It's got two edges coming out of it. So this one here, seven plus five is 12. That is not shorter than E. Um, seven plus four is 11, that is not shorter than nine. So even though we relax both of those two edges coming out of F, neither one changes anything. Um, but we do calculate that F is now a distance of seven. And finally, we pull off G at a distance of nine. And so we can actually trace and say, what was the shortest path to G? It was that, then that, then that, then that. Okay, so that's our shortest path and the total distance is nine along the way. So that shows you how Dijkstra's algorithm works. Um, again, uh, in C++, you would, keep a prior, you would keep your priority queue and you would keep adding new elements to it. Okay, now, if we have a negative edge, not a negative weight cycle. If we, if we have some guarantee that we don't have a negative weight cycle, but we might have a negative weight edge, then we can actually just use the variation on Dijkstra's algorithm that I talked about with C++. Uh, we'll actually solve this. So we can solve this using just like the C++ STL priority key version. 
uh, because what will happen in that case is that um, is that the negative weight edge will just mean that the node gets re-entered a second time, and we just we just process it there. So let's do a quick example of this. Let's say that we have a graph with four nodes, just to keep things relatively simple, A, B, C, and D. And I will go ahead and add a few edges along the way. So let's give one negative weight edge, minus two there. And I'll give one here that's four. And I'll give another one there that is also, uh, let's say that one's three. Let's say that we have one here that's four, and one here that's three, and one here that's five. And let's say that this is my source, uh, is A. And I want to find the distance, the minimum distance from something like A to D. Okay, so if I'm doing that, what I what I will do is keep my priority queue just like uh, we discussed before, but I'll enter potentially more things in there. So we start out with the only thing in there being A at a distance zero away. And so when we pull the first thing out of the priority queue, A is the smallest value. So I mark A and I keep track of the current value. Okay, this is something that can be updated. I say A is zero away. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and process A. So I process A and I calculate the distance to B is four and the distance to C is three. And so I'm going to enter each of those into the priority queue. Okay, and A being a distance zero has already been pulled out and I pull the next thing out. So in this case, the next thing that I process is C at three away. So I look at C, I relax its edges. I notice that I've got one edge that gets relaxed so I can calculate a distance of D, to D that is six away um, and I will be done processing C. And I enter D six in my priority queue. And at this point, I also, I just calculated that C was three. Now I pull out the next thing that's B4. So I go up here and I, I, I just handled C, I handled B being four. And I process, I, I relax the edges coming out of B. So first of all, the edge going down to D, four plus four is eight, that's not less than six, so I don't need to do anything with it. But notice this one, B over to C gives me a distance of two. And I look and I say, well, that is better than what I had before. Before I had three, but now I have two. So I'm going to update that three. And this is going to be a distance two away. And I will have to re-enter um, C with two into this queue. And I just handled B being four. That's the best I've seen for B so far. Well, now I go back to my priority queue. I pull out the smallest thing that I can out of it. And that's C two away. And so even though I've processed it once, I'm going to have to process it a second time. And potentially you might have to process things a, a few times, but I'm going to process this a second time uh, where now the base is two. So if I go two plus three, relaxing the edge to D, I'm going to also, I'm now going to have something that says D five is the distance away. And I will update C um, is no longer three away. It's now two away. Okay, I pulled the next thing out of the list. That would be D5. And when I do that, I relax its edges. Well, uh, the fact that it is five away, and if I do five plus five, that gets me back to A distance 10. That's not less than zero, so I don't do anything with it. And I'm done with that. Then I pull D6 off and I say, oh wait, I've already found something smaller than than uh, six, so I would just ignore that. And now my priority queue is empty, and now I have the shortest distance to each of the items uh, in, the, in the entire graph. So A is zero away, C is two away, B is four away, D is five away. Okay, so you, you hopefully, I went through that kind of fast, but hopefully you see how you can use a priority queue and just reinsert things along the way. And every time you need to check a couple of things, you need to check and see is when you pull it out of the priority queue, is it still the smallest thing that you have over here? And if so, you relax its edges. And even if you find, even if an edge is relaxed to something that's there, as long as it go, gets lower than what's there before, you stick the new thing back in the priority queue. Okay, now that works as long as there is not a negative weight cycle. 
Um, but if there is a, if there is potentially a negative weight cycle, then the algorithm that we can use is called Bellman Ford. Okay, and in a way you can almost think of this as a brute force solution to the problem. The idea of the Bellman Ford algorithm is if you have, if there's, if there's not a negative weight cycle, then the most number of times that any one edge could possibly need to be relaxed is V minus one. In other words, if I'm going through some graph and I have the shortest path from, you know, a node A to, to any, from between any two nodes, the, the longest that path can be is length N minus one. Okay, there's no way you can have a shortest path that's even size N because that would mean you'd have to form a cycle somewhere and that would not be a shortest path. Okay, so if there's not a negative weight cycle, then the shortest path can be at most length N minus one. And if there is a negative weight cycle, then the shortest path is infinitely long. It's longer than N minus one. You could, you could make things infinity long. And so the idea of Bellman Ford is you're basically going to uh, find all possible shortest paths or find a shortest path from the source up to uh, N edges away and edges long, sorry, up to N minus one edges long. And if you could relax any edge one more time, then that means you have a negative weight cycle. Okay, so if it's possible to relax edges n times or more, it means that you've got some path that's going to be a negative weight cycle is gonna be your shortest path. Okay, so when we say find the shortest path up to n edges long, what that means is we are going to relax all the edges um, and then repeat this n minus one times. Okay, so let me let me just show you kind of what this would look like here with Bellman Ford. Uh, so I will I will draw a graph, kind of another pretty simple graph, just so that we can illustrate the process here. So I'll have nodes A, B, C, and D, and I'm going to create a negative weight cycle. So this is going to be a path that could be negative. So. Okay, so that's a negative weight cycle. We might have some other edges in here, like maybe that one's four and that one's six. Uh, but in any case, there is definitely a negative weight cycle. So I can't really find any shortest path from any node to any other because it's going to be infinity. And the idea of the idea of Bellman Ford is I'm going to, to keep relaxing edges over and over. And in this case, there's four nodes. So I would do three relaxation steps. So in this case, n is equal to four, therefore I'll perform three relaxations on all the edges. So I'm gonna go through the entire graph and relax it three times. So we start out where a is a distance, and I'll start out with things in black, just so you can show. So the first iteration before I've done any relaxation is a is zero away, everything else is infinity away. Okay, so iteration one, I will do in blue. Okay, I'm gonna relax all of the edges in the entire graph from where they were previously and generate a, newest, a new shortest path. So in this case, this is gonna be a distance two away, this is gonna be a distance six away, and everything else is infinity, or D is still infinity, and A is, a is going to be um, still zero because infinity minus five from D is still zero. Okay, so that's iteration one. That's all, all there was to it. So iteration two is I will again go through every edge in the entire graph and I will try to relax it. So from, from whatever the previous state is and I'll, I'll draw these and I'll draw them 
I'll, sorry, I will draw it in blue just so you can see that that was still the value even after the first iteration. Okay, so the second iteration, now I look at all the edges coming out of A. So zero plus two is two, that's still the same thing. Zero plus six is six, that's the same thing. Uh, looking at those edges out of B, two plus four is going to get me down to six here uh, across that the edge from B. Two minus two would get me to zero in C. Um, the edge from C, remember we started at six. Six plus three to get down to D is nine. That's not less than six. Um, and infinity, which is the blue value minus five back to zero is still, uh, zero is still smaller. Okay, so after two iterations, those are the values we have. We have two at B, zero at C, six at D, um, and zero at A. Okay, in our third iteration, we'll again go through all the edges in the entire graph, and we will relax every single one of them again. So starting with these edges from A, uh, and, and sorry, I will leave these in green just to show that again, they haven't changed at all. So I'm gonna work from the green values now in this third iteration. So starting from A, we have the edge that's length two, and two is still the shortest distance to B. We have A going to C of length six. Well, zero plus six is bigger than zero, so there's nothing that needs to get updated there. Looking at the edges here from B, B, which is two minus two to C is zero. That's still the same thing. And two plus four to D is six. That's still no better. Looking at the edges from C, there's only one edge coming out, zero plus three. I will in fact update D to the value three. That's now a new shorter path than we had before. Um, and then looking at the edges from D, I had six minus five is one going to A. Well, that's not any bigger than A. So after our third iteration, we still have this setup. Okay, so we've now done N minus one relaxations. And so if, if there is not a negative weight cycle, then these values, the ones that are in red, will be the shortest distance to each of those nodes. So again, I'll, I'll say that again. If there is not a negative weight cycle, then we are guaranteed that after n minus one iterations, these distances are the shortest distance. There's no way that it couldn't be. Okay, if there is a negative weight cycle, then what that means is it's possible to relax one of these edges again. And you can actually verify this, you can visually see it, and I'll highlight it um, here in purple. Notice that this value for D following the edge minus five would end up making A a value minus two if we follow that edge from D. So D was a distance three away, there's an edge of minus five, so we could get A having a value of minus two. So since we could, still relax an edge. We have a negative weight cycle. Okay, so we found that we did have the negative weight cycle. That's the Bellman-Ford algorithm that will, that will do that for us. Okay, there is one final algorithm that I wanna talk about. Um, this is an all pairs shortest path algorithm. Okay, and it turns out that this is one of the easiest algorithms to implement that there is. You can do this in four lines of code is all it takes to do this. And I, the name of this is the floyd warshall algorithm. And it is actually a dynamic programming approach. So this is going to be a DP approach to the problem. Now, the first thing to notice is if we have an all pair shortest path, what we are going to calculate is going to be every node to every other node. We're going to need basically n squared pieces of information coming out. And so what that means is we might as well use 
an adjacency matrix. There's no, there's no real benefit to us to use an adjacency list or something like that, uh, because we're going to need to know the, the distance between, in the end, we're gonna need the minimum distance from any one thing to any other thing. And so it's just easier. It's much simpler to implement if we store everything as an adjacency matrix. Remember an adjacency matrix is where we have all of our, um, all of our nodes uh, in basically a, a two-dimensional grid where the row to the column means from, from node row to node column. Okay, so the fluid Warshall algorithm is a dynamic programming approach. And basically it is, saying, it is going to say the distance A, B, K is the minimum distance And maybe instead of A, B, I think I'll use X, Y here just to, since I'm going to use A and B in an example, going from node X to node Y uh, through nodes one through K. So in other words, we can use nodes one through K as intermediate nodes, but nothing bigger than K. And that's going to be D of X, Y, K. So um, what this means is that we can have D of X to X. So any node to itself, and I'm gonna assume no negative weight edges here, um, for, uh, for any K is gonna be zero by definition. So for a node to go to itself, that's going to be zero. This is one of the base cases. Uh, one of the other things that we have is the distance from X to y where we don't go through any of the nodes from like one to zero. So if we don't, can't go through any nodes, then this is just going to be the edge weight from x to y if there's an edge or it will be infinity if no edge. If there's not an edge between X and Y, so notice you can't go through any, any intermediate nodes. So this means that we have some graph out here and we have our, our edges from, from one thing to another, but we're not allowed to go through any intermediate nodes. So if this is one and two and three and four, if I'm only allowed to get from one to four without going through anything in between like two or three, then the only way I can do it is the direct edge from one to four. That's the only thing that's allowed. Okay, so um, these are kind of the base cases. And then the recursive case that we have here is going to be, excuse me, uh, the recursive case that we have is going to be D of X, Y, K is going to be the minimum of two possible choices. So one choice is, the shortest path from X to Y does not go through node number K. And so that would just mean that we've got a path from X to Y um, that is not going to include K. So X, Y, K minus one. So we just find whatever the shortest path is not including K. The other option is we do go through K. And so if that's the case, then you want to take the distance from X to K plus the distance I'm sorry, distance from X to K going through the other intermediate nodes plus the distance from K to Y going through the nodes up to K minus one. Okay, so what this is saying is if I'm going, if I'm wanting to find the distance from X to Y and I've got all these other nodes here and there's one of them K, I've got two choices. Either I ignore K, the top says I'm not gonna go through K, so I just find the, dis the shortest path from X to Y that goes through the other nodes. That's this top choice. Or the second thing is I say I do go through K, so I am, I am potentially going to go through, or I am going to go through node K. And so that means I wanna find the shortest node, the shortest distance from A to K, and then from K to Y. 
okay, whatever that is. I want to find the shortest path x to k and then k to y. And that's what the second one is. So those are my two options. Either I don't go through k, so I just solve a smaller problem that doesn't include k, or I do go through k, in which case I need to go from x to k and from k to y. And obviously, if I'm starting or ending at k, I don't need to use k as an intermediate node after that. And that's it. That's the that's the dynamic programming approach. Um, that's that's all there is to it. Um, and I'll I'll show how this can be implemented uh, when I code this up in class. But you can you can actually code this up in just a few lines of code. So let me do one very quick example showing you just a couple of steps. I'm not going to go through the entire Floyd Warshall algorithm, but I'll just show you how it works. So let's say that we have a graph. Again, we have a graph A, B, C, D, like this. And I will put some edges in here. I'll say there's one there, five, two, five, so it's three, um, one, four, and it says one. Okay, so if that's the graph that I have, I now want to compute an all pairs shortest path. So my base case, and this is going to be my basically x, y, zero. So this is just the nodes going through with no intermediate nodes. This is just going to be my adjacency matrix form of the graph itself. So, so basically it's just the adjacency matrix. So A, B, C, or D going to itself is obviously zero. So from A to B, we have an edge of weight five. From A to C, we have one of weight four. From A to D, we have one of three. We have one from B to C of weight two. Um, we have one from C to A of weight one. Um, we have one from C to D of weight five. And we have one from D to B of weight one. Okay, so that's our, our adjacency matrix. Well, then we would next compute the X, Y, one term. Okay. And remember that this is going to be the minimum of x, y, zero, uh, of the x, y, zero value, or it's going to be um, x, one, zero, um, and one being a in this case, x to a to zero plus um, a to y to zero for any x and y. Okay, so all of our diagonals are going to still be zero, um, but I'll show you one of the cases where something is a little bit different. So uh, let's write in these just to make it easier to see. So let's look at the edge from, oh, say C to B. Okay, so if we want to go from C to B, we've got two options here. So one of them is we can either look at distance of C to B zero, and notice C to B, the, that value uh, zero is infinity. Okay, so that's infinity. That is not a good value. Um, the other option is we would do the distance from C to A of zero plus the distance from A to B at zero. Okay, so from C to A is one, from A to B is five, so this is going to be one plus five. And so the answer that we get from C to B is going to be six. Okay, some of the values would stay the same as before. The shortest distance from C to A is still one. Um, we could do this again. We could, we could look at this uh, further. I believe that C to D would come out to be four in this case. So instead of five that we had up, up, up here, instead of that being five, it's going to be four because the, this is going to be the distance from uh, C to A zero plus the distance of A to D zero. And C to A is one, A to D is three. Notice that's the one and the three. And if I add those up, I get four, which is that value there. 
Okay, so that just shows you how Floyd Warshall can be used. The last thing that I want to mention is a little bit about uh, some very basic extensions uh, of Floyd Warshall. So for those of you who have the textbook, I would encourage you to read the textbook because um, there are a lot of these things are mentioned in there and they are described in a little bit more detail. Um, so one thing you can do is you can actually get the path. You get that path uh, by storing uh, a parent value in a separate matrix. So basically we keep another matrix along with the distance value that I was showing you before, uh, something that says here's the parent that we have for each individual node. So it's basically what route did we go through to get there. Um, so it is possible to extend that and that way you could actually reconstruct not just what's the shortest distance between two points, but what's the actual path between the two points. Um, so there is a way to use this for strongly connected components. That's going to be the topic of the next lecture, so I'll hold off on describing that, but just realize you can use uh, Floyd Warshall variation for doing that. Um, you can compute something called the transitive closure. And the transitive closure is basically Boolean of a yes, no, saying can a node be reached. And there's other ways of doing this. You can, you can sort of do transitive closures with union find and relaxing the edges and, and some things like that. Um, but uh, Floyd Warshall will let you do that. You basically store a one or a zero and uh, you use a bitwise or to, uh, to do your, uh, in, instead, of, instead of adding two things, you to find the distance you use a bitwise or. And so that basically will just connect things up in, in transitive closure. You can compute the diameter of the graph. And that is, that is basically what is the longest shortest path in the graph. So what's the longest distance that two points have, that you would have ever have to go from one node to another in the graph, assuming you were always taking the shortest path. And basically you look through the final grid that you got, you know, you look through your final distance grid and you just pull out the largest value. And so that largest value, that's the diameter of the graph. It tells you the maximum distance between any pair of points. Um, again, assuming they're, they're following that. We talked early on uh, when we were when we were talking about minimum spanning trees. We talked about doing minimax, uh, which is minimizing the maximum edge length. Um, but you can modify Floyd Warshall to compute minimax by uh, computing the maximum of the two distance values instead of the sum. So up here, where I was doing the sum at each of these points, uh, instead of computing sum, I could compute um, I could compute the max. And that's a way of basically converting this into a minimax problem. And then finally, there is the uh, there is a way to use this to find uh, the, the cheapest cycle. So basically, what's the what's the um, you know the cheapest way that you can actually get a cycle that that go, connects from one thing to another? Um, and basically, that just means that you modify your distance values so that the initial adjacency matrix, instead of starting with, with zeros along the diagonal here, you start with a very high value, and then you let those values decrease over time so that, a, so that any node can come back to itself. And when you run it, if the distance ever gets back to a lower value than whatever your really high almost infinity value is, then that means that there was a cycle. And so the smallest value that you have the, uh, basically along that diagonal is going to give you the minimum cycle length. Or if you have a negative ed edge weight cycle, it'll identify that there is a negative weight cycle uh, by running that a few times. So Floyd Warshall, it's actually a very, it's a very flexible algorithm. You can just make a lot of little variations on it. Again, it's very short to code. It doesn't, it doesn't take much code at all, like four lines of code. You can code the entire thing up um, and, and work from there. 
Okay, so that is our overview of shortest path algorithms, and uh, and hopefully that was a good review or introduction to those if you hadn't seen them before.